Deborah Young from BASF, a global uh, paint and coatings organization here headquartered. Uh, well, her office is headquartered in North America, and I'm really excited to talk with her today. Uh, as a reminder, today's session is intended to dig into the question around how are we maintaining a connected culture? Uh, culture applies to both our home life, our work life, and our communities. So today we're going to focus on those three areas with Deb. Deb, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Now, where are you taking this call from today? Okay. Wonderful. And Deb, uh, why don't you share with uh, the audience how we know each other? How, how, how have we come into, uh, into contact and how long ago was that? I think it was actually class 30 uh, 10 years ago. So 2011, 2010 would have been uh, roughly when we first connected. Well, wonderful. I am, uh, I'm super glad to have you on Creating a Connected Culture, a, a live interview here on Facebook and other social media platforms where we talk with leaders, uh, specifically in HR and leadership around the globe on ways that they're keeping a connected culture uh, at their organizations. Before we jump into uh, some of those things, I like to play an exercise to kind of warm things up to make sure the people that are listening have a chance to really get to know uh, the interviewee on the other end. So we're going to play an exercise called If You Really Knew Me. And if you really knew me is what I like to refer to as a great way to uh, kind of infuse some virtual vulnerability as we continue to connect both online uh, and in our virtual spaces. So I'll model it for you, Deb, just so you can kind of get the gears churning so you feel like you have some, uh, some priming into what it means to uh, play the exercise. But for those that are listening, this is a great game to play with your teams in your one-on-ones or even on a family reunion. Uh, but uh, wherever your virtual kind of platform is, if you really knew me is focused on sharing statements that are more revealing in nature onto who you are and maybe some of those things that kind of create intimacy or into me in which you see. So like I mentioned, I'll go first, Deb, I'll share. So uh, if you really knew me, you would know that I have a four and a six-year-old uh, son and daughter. Uh, if you really knew me, you'd know that uh, I struggle to get, a, get along with my six-year-old son and I'm working through some major uh, discipline and respect issues. If you really knew me, you would know that I'm a huge Kenny G fan. I love hip hop. I love Christian music, but I also love Kenny G, the saxophone player. And uh, if you really knew me, you'd know that I often smile on the outside, but don't always feel that way on the inside. So that's how the game plays. Uh, Deb, I'm going to kick it over to you for the if you really knew me exercise and uh, good luck. He is the greatest artist of all time. He is my favorite artist. Uh, if you really knew me, you would know that I am fairly introverted. People have a very difficult time believing that. I prefer um, working behind the scenes and helping and coaching others to be successful. Uh, if you really knew me, you would know that um, ego and um, pride are pet peeves of mine. And if you really knew me, um, you would know that I practice service uh, servant leadership. Awesome. Deb, I'm getting some feedback that we can't hear you. Can you hear Deb now? Okay. It looks like we can. Okay. Wonderful. And oh. I have um, wonderful. lost wonderful. your audio. Okay. You lost my you lost audio. My audio. So, I can um, hear you now. Okay. So Deb, so next, Deb question. next question. How are you How creating are you a connected culture, culture at BSF? BSF? All right. Well, actually, before I, I mentioned that, Mark, I want to thank you for the promotion. Um, I looked at the Facebook 
uh, posting and I am the HR leader for the coatings business or the coatings division of BASF, but that's one of 11 divisions within the global organization. And so um, I just wanna make that distinction that I am not the head of HR for all of BASF, but I'm, heading, I'm head of HR for the coatings business for North America. But thank you for the promotion. I appreciate that. Not a problem. Um, no problem. <laughs> so let's see, when I think about how I'm supporting teams, uh, there are two teams that I directly engage with every single day one of which is my HR organization. I have about 10 um, people that report to me in, U in the US, Canada, and Mexico. And then the second team, which is team one, is the leadership team. And uh, we engage in slightly different ways, but I think uh, in equally important ways. So within my organization, within the, within the human resources organization, especially from the past year, when uh, we have been working remotely. Um, we, I think very early on, recognized the importance of staying connected. Um, it was an extremely stressful, challenging, demanding year uh, for everyone. And um, what I decided to do is in addition to our regular um, <clears throat> HR team meetings where there's business and HR updates that, that I share, uh, we scheduled bi-weekly just check-in meetings, very informal. And the intent of these meetings is really for the team to connect and bond with each other. Um, and so I took ideas from them in terms of what might be most meaningful for them. So, you know, one of the meetings uh, is really um, based on what we call a GTK or get to know. So each team member provides like a one-page slide that's called about me. And uh, they share whatever they're comfortable sharing with regard to either their hobbies, their interests, their family, their friends, basically non-work topics. And, um, and then we have some other activities. We've had um, a virtual um, trivia uh, contest. We've had a cooking demonstration with one of our um, uh, team members uh, who is very uh, handy in the kitchen. We have also done a painting um, uh, exercise with one of the team members leading us uh, through through that activity. And it really gives us a chance to engage and connect on a much more personal level. And that's uh, within the HR uh, organization. At the leadership team level, we have um, done a few things actually. We've invited guest speakers in like yourself uh, to come in and talk to us about the importance of maintaining balance and um, to not overuse our digital and, and social media tools to be all consuming. We have had um, initially during the early stages of the pandemic last year, we had weekly all employee calls with our um, operating division leader, uh, Chris Toomey, and they were called conversations with Chris. They were typically scheduled for one hour. And as you can imagine last year, we as members of the leadership team, we were fielding um, questions constantly from our workforce about, um, you know, COVID, you know, safety aspects, uh, what policies and practices we were going to put into place to help people cope and manage during that time. We have strongly engaged our employee resource groups to also provide another connection opportunity for our employees, and they have been extremely well received. Uh, some of us on the leadership team, we also have a Monday 5 p.m. virtual happy hour. It's completely voluntary. And uh, we find ways of staying connected in between meetings, whether we are um, you know, texting each other or using one of the digital tools that we have from a collaboration standpoint. So those are just a few of the ideas that we're doing. Uh, it sounds like you, sounds there's like no you shortage of shortage things that you guys have been doing. Deb, if you want to mute me just for a second, so then I can back it up on your phone. Okay. Uh, but that was Deb just was sharing, sharing uh, a variety uh, of ways uh, that she is uh, creating a connecting culture, culture and everything from uh, get to know you on the um, get to know you uh, meetings uh, with uh, executives and individuals, kind of leaning into more of that personal space, uh, and also just having an opportunity to um, balance that kind of digital and analog time together. Lost the audio again. All right. All right. So, so Deb, we're having some audio audio difficulties, but I'm going to ask you the next question. What do you think the future of the hybrid workforce looks like, like at BASF? All right. All right. I think I heard most of that question. The future of the hybrid work model. Was that it? That's it. That's it. Okay, great. Thank you, Mark. So this is an active um, project. So let's just say this. We, um, you know, we have already recognized and proven the fact that we can work productively and efficiently in a remote environment. So there is no need to prove our ability to do that as an organization. 
um, last year, again, I remember it was March 13th, where we made the decision to send people home. And overnight on a global basis, 40% of the BASF global colleagues converted from being primarily based in the office to working in a virtual remote or home-based environment. And we've continued to do that. Now, as we are approaching what we hope will be the tail end of this pandemic, the question becomes, what does the future of work look like? And the future of work is right now. It is highly unlikely that we will be going back to pre-pandemic norms of expecting people to be in the office five days a week. So we have been uh, working um, with our colleagues and with our leaders to find um, working schedules that will work not only for the business or the team, but also for the individual employee as they balance the needs of family, whether or not they are you know, the primary caretakers and had to do homeschooling uh, while the schools were, were closed here in Michigan, whether or not they are caring for elderly parents, uh, whether or not they have family members that have been directly or, in, uh, or indirectly impacted by COVID. So flexibility and agility will be key in terms of determining um, our work schedules as we prepare to return to the office, whether it's later this year or early next year. Um, fortunately, we've got access to great tools and resources that help us um, you know, evaluate roles that lend themselves to either 100% virtual, 100% in office or hybrid. We have uh, access to digital tools that will enhance collaboration and engagement for our employees, making sure that we have uh, the opportunities to stay connected and have what we call these um, you know, casual uh, uh, collisions, uh, i.e. that used to be referred to as the water cooler, impromptu ad hoc conversations that we miss uh, since most of us have been working remotely. Now, I will say a number of our colleagues uh, who cannot work from home would include some of our, uh, our chemists. Uh, these are people that develop the formulations for our paint. You can't replicate a lab in a home environment most effectively. Uh, as well as some of our maintenance and engineering staffs in our um, operating plants throughout the U.S. So uh, we definitely anticipate continuing the flexibility and the agility that we've been able to experience for the past year. That's awesome. That's that awesome. Flexibility, that flexibility and agility. And agility. Yeah. Key yeah. Words. Key words. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's your biggest concern, concern in the future of work about, future work about, keeping, work about keeping your team, your team kind, of kind of connected as well as, well as, as their overall sense of, sense of um, I guess you could call, you could call pulse, on, pulse the on the organization's culture. Yeah, so we have formal and informal mechanisms to keep a sense of the, the engagement. We have uh, an engagement survey uh, that's typically done once a year. And unlike other organizations where we've taken a lot of surveys, we actually act upon the feedback and the surveys that we, that we, um, that we take. And we thank our employees for giving us the feedback and in addition to that, um, we know that the, one of the biggest challenges, I think, is that some people will miss the, um, the in-face, the person-to-person. -person. So we have to find and strike the right balance between being able to work remotely versus there will be some times where people might need to come into the office or they will need to come into the office. For example, if it's an all-employee event, if it's a town hall, uh, we have an annual employee um, mm -hmm awards program called the Codings Impact Awards. And so for those type of events where we really want the esprit de corps uh, and having people uh, engage face-to-face, -face, we'll probably still have some of uh, these in-person encounters. But beyond that, um, we anticipate our leaders being able to have the discretion to determine the scheduling flexibilities that will work best uh, for their teams and their employees but I think one of the other challenges that we've discussed very openly, Mark, is uh, screen fatigue, right? Um, whether you are on a Zoom or for us internally, it's WebEx or Microsoft Teams during the day, or maybe you're helping um, you know, your children at home with their online school requirements. This screen fatigue and Zoom fatigue is very real. I remember um, maybe six months into the pandemic, and a group of my really, really close friends, primarily they're from Chicago, and they wanted to have a uh, Zoom catch-up call. And this was at the end of a day where, you know, most of my days are easily 10 or 12 hour days. And uh, I just hit a wall. I hit a wall and I said, I cannot look at a screen for one more minute. So I'm gonna call in with my phone and I'm gonna listen, but I am not uh, looking at a screen for another minute today. 
So I think this, the the um, the issue and challenge of screen fatigue is real, and we're going to have to figure out how to manage and navigate that moving forward. Yes, uh, screen fatigue is real. I've spent my whole career in the last two years uh, getting people to navigate uh, Zoom fatigue, Teams fatigue, whatever you want to call it. But it ju just speaks to that the, the nature of the way the world and the work world is shifting so swiftly. And as uh, kind of stewards of uh, the employee morale and uh, you know just general health and wellness for our our teams, um, it is one of those hurdles that I think we we need to uh, approach together collectively um, as we figure out what is that right balance. How are we? I liked what you said about agility and flexibility. I think those are two core principles to ensuring that people have um, autonomy to what works for them or their specific teams, whether you're in the warehouse or whether you're in uh, a chemist in the back office or whether you are uh, you know, working from home uh, managing payroll, whatever the case is, I think that flexibility and agility is key. Um, Deb, what would be some general comments that you'd share uh, regarding um, you know, um, how you believe, if you're a leader of a small team and you don't have a clear path on when you're returning to work, what would be some counsel you'd give uh, them on ways that they can create connections within their teams? Sure. So with any particular issue or challenge, you know, we have to start with the business need or the team need in mind. And you have to start with the assumption is how can we continue to fulfill, you know, our team obligations, our business obligations to meet customer, you know, expectations. How can we do that? That's the leading question. And then within that space, I would say get direct feedback and input uh, from the members of the team in terms of what would work um, best for them and ideally for them. We no longer work in a world where it's one size fits all, right? And I think uh, as long as I've been in the HR leadership space, um, you know, we would we would develop policies and practices with that concept in mind, one size fits all, and anything uh, couldn't be further from the truth today. And so I think when you are a leader of a smaller team, you actually have the greater opportunity to develop and craft solutions that will work for the team uh, individually and as a whole. As long as the, the team and the business and the customer needs and expectations are being met, I think the leader should embrace the additional autonomy, discretion, and flexibility that they may, may have to co-create solutions with their employees. And uh, what works for me may not work for you. And I think we have to be open to that diversity in terms of how we lead and manage our teams in this type of environment. Deb, I love it. That's uh, that's really good advice. I know you've been in the HR space for a long time and uh, your wisdom and counsel is probably uh, helpful for those that are just uh, figuring out ways to um, approach even uh, growth-based organizations who are hiring 20, 30, 40, 50 employees uh, 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 per quarter, per month. It's how are you, how, how are you all onboarding um, new hires to BASF and what does that process look like? Oh my gosh, Mark, I love that question. This, <laughs> this is, uh, within HR, um, I think onboarding is just one of the areas where um, I am just a stickler for because what happens is an employer will court you during the recruiting process, right? And then um, when you arrive, your experience or your expectations may or may not line up with what you expected, right? And I call this day one readiness. So about a year and a half ago, um, let's just say that our HR organizational structure within North America for BASF changed to the point where I was able to hire a dedicated team. And I have the luxury, and I mean that literally, of having a dedicated person on my team who is responsible for new hire onboarding as well as learning and development. So not only do I have the role, but and, and not only do I have a person in the, uh, in, in the role, but I have someone who brings the passion to understanding the impact that we want to have on our new hires, not just our new hires, but certainly make sure that there's no buyer's remorse and make sure that they feel supported, not during the first day or two or a month or two on the job, but that at least that first year and to partner with them and their immediate manager and supervisor to make sure they've got the tools and the resources to navigate the culture and all of the other unwritten expectations that, that um, may be um, prevalent, but if you, if you don't know, you don't know. And so we have built a very robust um, new hire onboarding program that some of our other operating divisions are replicating from a best practices standpoint. So I think about when I started with BASF about four and a half years ago, uh, let's just say that my onboarding experience 
left a, a lot to be desired. Uh, and uh, I'm probably still recovering from the experience. And so from that, I just said, you know, I really don't want anyone else to have the same experience that I did. And so I've been very focused on that for the past couple of years. Awesome. It sounds like you all are uh, kind of on the forefront of uh, figuring it out on the, on the fly, as we like to say, uh, you know, b b building the plane in midair. Um, Deb, this is great. As we kind of round our time together, I guess I'm curious to know from you, just in the season that we've all been in with regards to change and growth, um, can you share maybe a few reflections on personally what you have gathered from this t season of what I'll kind of project as resilience for the for the human condition? And just kind of share some remarks on that. Right. So when we think about the year 2020, um, and then you reflect back on that, I remember us having to not only shift uh, to being remote 100% of the time, but because I'm a member of the senior leadership team, we were having um, you know daily crisis management meetings. Um, the demand on our energy, our time, our spirit was um, just incredible. And even now I reflect back on again, just the past year. And I, I don't have a logical way of explaining how we got through it other than um, the support and the, I would say camaraderie and the alignment that we've been able to establish as members of, our, of the leadership team. So we have setbacks, we have arguments, we have disagreements, but ultimately um, it's, it's really an honor to be part of this particular leadership team because we support each other. And so uh, when we do have setbacks, we are able to recover fairly quickly. We try not to wallow. We try to learn what we can um, and move forward. And I think there's a lot of energy on this team to do just that. So I, I'm actually pleasantly surprised able to respond and recover from what was a very difficult year last year for us. Wow, that's, wow, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, there's a lot there's a there lot. In, uh, in that response. Um, so I appreciate you kind of offering that up to the group. We have a final question that I want to ask from a listener. Um, this is uh, Tim uh, Henley, a good friend of mine from a, a former kind of career. He says, what are your thoughts on 360 reviews in the remote workspace? Great questions, Tim. I think that that is a great question as well. I think we have to redefine what um, good performance looks like in, in a remote environment, right? It's not about necessarily the same metrics or same uh, factors that we would traditionally use. So I think if you are go going to use a 360 and just think about it as you know, just key stakeholder feedback, you know, from the peer level, from the immediate manager, and then from maybe um, others that that manager or leader may support. But what does success look like um, now in a virtual environment? And then make sure that that 360 tool or instrument is is um, consistent with your new ways of working versus an older or more traditional approach. Deb, that's a uh, that, that's another one of those things that I hadn't thought of. Is is how, how are you gathering? Uh, you know, literally three hundred and sixty when we don't have the fortune of having like I picture like little uh, baby cam set up at our employees' uh, homes, uh, kind of uh, uh, live streaming our interactions, but. Again, um, it's just another one of those dynamics of this hybrid work world that we're, we're figuring out. Um, Deb? Right, the metrics, what are the, what are the key metrics or what are the success deliverables associated with that, role, that person's role? And then how do they go about uh, achieving it? So the what and the how remain, I think, universally important, even in a virtual environment. Uh, thank you so much, Deb. This has been a great interview. Deborah Young with BASF North America and the HR Group. We're so glad to have you here today. Uh, Deb, any final thoughts before we part? No, thank you for the invitation. Um, I certainly um, am available to others if they want to reach out um, on, on my Facebook page, but I appreciate the invitation to join you today, Mark, and um, let's let's get after it in this new year which is all, almost uh, halfway over here now. I love it, Deb. Thank you so much. This has been a great, uh, great uh, opportunity just to continue to deepen what it's like to create a connected culture uh, at a large organization that has global uh, presence throughout, throughout the world, uh, BASF. 
And I'm just grateful to have leaders like Deb uh, giving me some of their time to come on the show, creating a connected culture. If you know somebody within your team or your organization that you think would benefit from uh, being broadcasted live on this series, I'd love to connect with them. Uh, you can reach me at hello at markosdash.com. Otherwise, uh, just really grateful to have you tuning in today. Again, uh, Courage to Connect, a recent book that I wrote on creating meaningful connections in an online and offline environments. Really grateful to have you all here today. Uh, thank you so much, and we will see you soon at our next uh, uh, at our next series, and uh, we'll go from there. So thanks so much, and we'll and we'll talk. To you.